But then I'm taking every Hawaiian language class I can get my hands on. So I went and declared a second major for Hawaiian language. And the counselor laughed out loud. He says, you know, for what? You know, and what do you think you'd do with it? And you're not Hawaiian anyway. You know, why would you? I said, well, I'm interested. And that's really all I was, was I was just interested. Ever hear someone speak of the kona of a song, the hidden meaning? Hawaiian language scholar Puakea Nogelmeyer says the kona may be even more hidden than some folks think. Puakea Nogelmeyer, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. In this edition of Long Story Short, the story of Puakea Nogelmeyer, who found himself stranded in Hawaii and found himself. He became a Hawaiian language scholar, University of Hawaii teacher, and a Hoku award-winning songwriter. Of course, he wasn't always Puakea. In 1972, during a brutal Minnesota winter, young Marvin Nogelmeyer quit his job at the post office and left in search of adventure in the Far East a lost wallet short-circuited the trip. He found work as a goldsmith in Waianae, and on another lark, he joined the hula halau of Bililani Allen. That's where he began his immersion in Hawaiian language and culture. Mililani Allen's own teacher, the legendary kumuhula Mikey Ayu Lake, bestowed upon him the name Puakea, white flower or fair child, along with the expectation of positive things to come. Puakea is indebted to his many teachers, most notably cultural expert and photographer Theodore Kelsey. For 10 years, the old man, Mr. Kelsey, would meet with a young man at least once a week at the home of writer June Kutmanis. Mostly, the more we worked together, the more we went into old material getting to understand by now I could get when he's talking about the poetry, you know, what makes a kanikau a kanikau and how this is phrased this way. And what, what are some of the subtleties he told you early on? Mm. Well, sometimes it's like the choice of a, of a pattern. You know, you use a pattern, a, a he pattern, a o pattern, a aya pattern, an ua pattern, and why that emphasis here pulls something into focus. So now watch how that focus is flavoring what follows it. So, you know, understanding line three because of what was happening in line one. And there's things today that I'll think, that's what he said about, you know, I mean, that's why he pointed. And was he a, a rare gem or were there a number of people who understood Hawaiian language and um, subtleties that way? He was an odd duck. There were still people in the late 70s and 80s. There was. You know, that's when they started to predict language death. Mm -hmm. The median age of language speakers was, they were in their 70s. There were very few children outside of the Ni'ihau community. So they said 10, 15 years, there will be no speakers left. And, and there were so many people who took it as, well, yes, it is on, on the brink of extinction. Yeah. It's almost Hawaii. like, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's like, oh, that's What can we bad. do while well, there's no yeah. current use for it? Yeah, the language revitalization that kicked up from the 70s has just, it's never lost its drive. It's never lost its momentum. It's still, you know, extending and growing. And that has kept me entertained for three decades. You know, ever since it, um, I launched into language, there's been a dynamic force moving forward. I might estimate 10,000 people today who can work with Hawaiian language, who have different levels of fluency where they can utilize Hawaiian language either as a uh, conversational tool or as a writing or reading or listening tool. You know, it's a usable level of it. And probably twice that, that have at least an insight into it. They can say the right things in the morning and they can ask for, where's the lua or something, you know. They... I've been in elevators, I've been at football games where people are talking Hawaiian. And what gets me is they're using, um, they're, you know, they have modern day they're, they're <laughs> describing modern day phenomena and uh -huh. they have the words for it. Yeah, yeah. That their Chevy has a flat tire and, you know, da, 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 or. The refrigerator yeah. is busted. Yeah, the iPod isn't working today. He and made a they great can, touchdown. And they can do it all, yeah. So the new words that have come into the language, that's a sign of vitality. 
the continuity of old words, that's a sign of strength. So you got to have both of that, you know. So, um, where, I, where are we going with the language? How, how many people will one day speak it? Do you think it'll, um, as a percentage of the population in terms of speakers, how, how, mm. how Okay, my starry-eyed optimist, which is mostly who I am anyway, is that by the time of my demise, much of the population of Hawaii will have some access to Hawaiian language. They'll have pieces that they can use because there will be a much larger population that uses it regularly. Well, we know that charter schools, many charter schools are teaching and learning Hawaiian mm -hmm. language. Kamehameha Schools has, has made a commitment. Faculty, staff, giant. students will speak fluent mm -hmm. Hawaiian because it's part of their culture. It's a necessary part of and understanding And formalized it. that commitment relatively recently, but they made a commitment way back that whoever wants to learn will make room. And they started hiring teachers to match the demand, not to set up, you know, the balance in curriculum. And Hawaiian language just exploded there. It matches the university. For more than 30 years, Puakea Nogelmeyer has been working to perpetuate an appreciation of the richness and intricacies of the Hawaiian language and culture. He translated into English, all 500 pages of it, the epic tale of Hi'iaka Okapoleo Pele. He's collaborating with others to translate into English many 19th and 20th century Hawaiian newspaper articles and put them online. If you ride the bus on Oahu, Puakea Nogelmeyer's voice announcing street names will accompany your journey. No matter what I do in my life, whatever accomplishments I may fulfill, I will be remembered for being the voice of the bus, is what I'm thinking. Because that's what I get introduced as now. Oh, and he's the voice of the bus. Um, so it's kind of an in-house joke. But they wanted my pronunciation. So they said, let's try, let's try. So in the studio, I'm on my tiptoes. Because you have to go higher? Is that what happens? And I have to do it at my highest range, <laughs> my highest clear range. So I'm saying, Kala Kaua, Ala Moana Center. But to have something repeated over and over, almost immediately, all the bus drivers were pronouncing all the street names, like I do. So they're going, oh, well, I'll be down on the Kina Ut side. You know, and I'll whip it. Kina Ut doesn't have the Okina on the sign for the freeway. You notice. It doesn't. But they were starting to use this reference point. And um, Kama'aha, uh, the guy who set it up through the bus, we were going to write an academic article on how to measure this impact. Because it's really, it's rather widespread. We have two friends visiting here, a son and uh, his father from Maryland, I guess it is. They speak Marylandese, you know. But the son is 17. He takes the bus every day. Dad doesn't. Dad's having a terrible time pronouncing anything. It's all vowels. And it's a, son doesn't see it in print. He's seeing it the way he hears it. So he goes, no, we got to go up to Kapi'olani, Dad. Well, that's a community service then, isn't this it? This is, it's, well, it's an impact that we didn't presage. We didn't expect. And you can't really measure, but yeah, it has an impact. It's going to set a model. Ma'ili. I used to do talks at Ma'ili Elementary School and go, how many of you live in Ma'ili? Nobody, how many of you live in Miley? <laughs> you know? And it's just what, what's normalized. And I don't get into right and wrong about it. It's what's you know, common in different circles. But at what point does common usage change accepted pronunciation? And that's a dynamic, isn't it? It's got to be. I mean, sometimes common usage can still be overridden by um, desire. How's that? <laughs> Maybe that works. Puakea Nogelmeyer is a teacher who says he's still learning and still setting high standards for himself. He also has high expectations of those who take his classes at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I am considered a dragon. And it's because I'm, I'm intense, but it's because I'm, I am passionately engaged in what I'm doing, and I want them to be passionately engaged. So I think I'm very clear. I want this, 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 and this. And I'm adamant about that we do it. From that first class that I taught, I just, and I never wanted to be a teacher, but it was so rewarding to get them to play with something that I loved. And I mean, and I had people that I was playing with that these are the most fun people. And, you know, 
I'd get Mr. Kelsey to come into class. You know, he visited school a couple times. Kamwela Kumuka, he used to come every semester and visit all my classes. Say, so you gotta meet these, these are the real guys to play with. The university is a step on the way elsewhere. It's not a finished product. And I used to, because there is a university dialect. You know, there is, and it can be faulted or it can just be recognized, you know. We're putting up pillars and beams. If you want to go thatch this house, <laughs> you got to get out and use it in the, the language community with the native speakers, with the, the places that it's being used. If you go out here with your pillars and your beams and no thatch and pretend you're a finished product, it's kind of like the emperor with no clothes. People are going to recognize <laughs> that, you know, stop. But because I ended up like working with Mr. Kelsey with and these, a lot of what I learned, I think, is outside of the classroom. So it's certainly twisted. It's not native speaker. And because I'm a teacher, I could probably be, be closer to a native speaker dialect just from spending enough time in the, the right zones and hanging and getting corrected. And, you know, Kamuela was really good about stopping me and going, you know, if you want this clear, say it like this. Is there anything you'd like people to know about the language who may have taken a bit of a bit of language or hear some language but aren't they're not speakers of the Hawaiian language? Something th that you'd like them to know about how the language works and why? The kinds of things that I'd want to point out is like the focus tends to be on the setting, not on the doer. It'll be on the action, not the person doing the action. So just that whole structure is kind of turned around from English. So people who've played with it a little bit, it's really good to get a handle on, you know, that I went to the store turns into went. Because that, the first thing out of your mouth is the most important thing. English is very actor oriented. Hawaiian is action or setting oriented. And then the actor is, you know, placed within that. So that's, I think that you got to be able to sort of embrace a different mindset of the language. Sometimes you hear a, a speech in Ho the Hawaiian language and then you see the kupuna laughing because there's a joke on another level <laughs> that other people don't get. Well that's you know one of the the beauties of the language one of the difficulties of the language is the issue of words with six and seven meanings and oratory and poetry are the two places where you can play those and put in double meanings triple meanings they can be either sarcasm, they can be um, something sexual, they can be risque at least, or you know, flirtatious, whatever. And it can be interpreted in the cleanest and clearest, or you can catch. Not everybody will catch. The ones who are catching are the ones who are laughing. And they go deep? Yeah, yeah. And they, they'll, they'll catch that there's two going on. And that was always an honored game. It's a positive thing to be able to catch them, but it's a real positive thing to be able to cast them. So that was once a really widespread skill. And um, almost a game, I mean, it really it's a, a national pastime in its way, is to be able to play, play with words, play back and forth. Mr. Kelsey was a bit, uh, he was a dry, you know, sort of a contained gentleman. And I learned a great deal from him. He was a wonderful guy. And then I started playing with Auntie Sarah Nakoa. She was a teacher up at UH. I worked with her at Kamehameha Schools. She taught me to play in the language. She played all the time. She looked like a battleship. She taught like a dragon. I was never her student, but I mean, I always heard that she came into class and was always really surly and sort of curmudgeon -y and that. But when, then when she'd play back and forth, she had the best sense of humor I'd ever seen. And she would launch a line and just give her the sort of battleship demeanor until you got it. And if you didn't get it, she didn't change. And if you got it, then there's like this crack in the armor. So she and I became sort of playmates. And honestly, I'd have to credit her with having taught me to laugh in Hawaiian. Because she, yeah, she was just a whole different side of it. You must get asked all the time. Are you Hawaiian? No, I do. And, I do. <laughs> and, I and, get, and are you accepted 
at, at a really basic level in the fluent speaking community? Mm. Well, there's acceptance, you know. A, I'm not Hawaiian, and, and I wasn't Hawaiian before, and I won't be Hawaiian next week either. But um, there's always been uh, a level of acceptance, you know, and yet a level of both surprise and, wait a minute, do you fit here or not? And it depends, different circles and different individuals. So, I mean, there's, there's individuals that really wish I'd get on a jet and go back to Minnesota. Just for the simple fact of your... That I'm not Hawaiian. Oh. And that you don't have business, but that's a an issue of how people interpret kuleana, you know. And um, I interpret it, and, and I don't have an option of how to interpret it. I interpret it as my teachers taught me it, and um, part of it is haphazard is how it falls upon you, but how you fulfill it is your business, and. Uh, some people don't like that. I feel that I'm fulfilling a, a really serious kuleana. I had teachers that other people didn't have. And they taught me in the hope of things would, would be kept up, would be kept alive. So. And uh, did they teach you because you were the only one who was really interested in their lives? You know? Or they, wh wh what do you think a, it was? Yeah, see, there's a dynamic in teaching. Like Mr. Kelsey, I think, golly, he would have taught anybody and just, Nobody really found him. And he didn't much. have that sense of, I can't teach him. This man is not no. Hawaiian. He, um, no, I mean, at first, you just, I, come on, when, when we met, now he's 88. I'm, you gotta imagine this, right? I'm, what am I then, 20 something? 20, 30, I'm 35 pounds less than I am sitting in front of you. So I'm this skinny little rail of a guy, hair down to here, very flippant, very, you know, I'm. Uh, I'm a pothead. I'm a silly guy. I'm fun, you know. And um, I can't imagine that I hit his spot as the perfect student. And it was after a few years that, you know, I mean, he knew I was seriously interested, but I, I had to be as alien to him as he was to me. Yeah, he had to look past and yeah. see who you really Thank are. Thank God his vision probably wasn't <laughs> that good. You know, because, uh, you know, I was engaged, and that made a difference. And after a couple of years, June had told me, she says, you know, Mr. Kelsey said something about, he thinks you'll keep up his work. Oh, that's I a just, great I was so, well, and it was a, uh, I mean, it actually really touched me, because I also thought, oh God, now I, you know, now I'm on, in debt, sorta. I mean, now, now I have to be serious. You know, yeah, he passed the baton and you didn't know you, in a way, you picked it up. And part of that was his work with the Kumulipo, which I would, he worked on for 70 years, trying to interpret the Kumulipo. And there's no way I'll be able to carry out what, you know, he was aiming for. He promised though, there was a lot of questions. Um, and he promised that if after he died, he got him, he'd come back and tell me. And the Kumulipo is the story? Oh, the Genesis chant. Or it's a chant of creation. So it's like a 2,000 line. And it's a bit of a puzzle. And he was convinced that it was actually recorded when it was written down out of sequence in a couple of places. But to find those breaks in sequence, you'd have to have a total understanding of the whole piece and what the, almost the mathematical um, structures within it were. Because he, he insisted that the priests that there was a structure behind the chant that the priests understood that allowed them to memorize something. 2,000 lines is a, long, a lot to remember. You touched upon this a little before, but tell me about Kauna. You know, it comes up a lot because people think that Kauna is like the hidden meaning. You know, if I'm talking about, let's say, Ahulili is a song uh, for, over on Maui. And it's, it's a song about these pu'u in the Kipahulu district. And it's about how this pu'u is jealous because all the other pu'u, the mist comes down and settles on them. So that's the song. People think the kauna is that some girl or guy looks around and everybody else is getting some and they're not. So <laughs> the jealousy is that and that that's the kauna. And I would disagree that that's, that's the underlying meaning, and that's 
really presented pretty fairly. You know, a, uh, writing a song about a jealous mountain would be kind of an odd thing. Using it as a metaphor or as a, an analogy for some jealous person who's doing this. So all the other mountains are getting mounted, or pu'us are getting mounted by the mist, and I'm not. So, yeah. um, and it's a funny song. The real kauna to that, because Kavena Pukui says, nobody can understand kauna. But I can understand this. I mean, this is pretty apparent. Anybody reading the liner so notes So that's can. not kauna. So either Kavena's wrong or that's not kauna. And Kavena's right. What she describes is, she says, the kauna is really the story that launched that song. The kauna is what the poet knew. The, this is just a story about, you know, anybody will be jealous when they see everybody else is getting mm -hmm. what they want and they're not getting it. The kauna in this song is what inspired that poet to write the song. He knew a girl who was, you know, in this setting, and, and her name was Lucy, and she died. So that requires further research outside the And may the song. never be known outside of the circle of the poet and those that are real close. And that's, that I really understand. I compose music, and mine have oftentimes a literal meaning. And most of mine are rascal pieces, and they're, you know, da -da -da, they have some sexual innuendos or what. Um, and everybody gets those and they laugh. That's not the kauna. And I understand this, that, you know, the kauna really is the night that happened that made me think of this, that made me develop this. The kauna is the seed that made that piece come about. So. And that's, you know, it was confusing for me for a long time. I teach a class on Hawaiian poetry, on the structures within and whatnot, so we're always trying to address this. I have to think that Hawaiian poetry does not involve rhyming, because almost everything would rhyme. <laughs> Wouldn't that's it? That's why it doesn't involve it. Every word in the language ends in one of five vowels. So Hawaiian stepped away from rhyming and will intentionally avoid it. And you've heard the term linked assonance. I don't know that word. Oh, okay. It's kind of a fun um, thing, and it was recognized right away. The end of a line will match by sound to the beginning of the next line. Oh, I see. Linked assonance. So the ass of the sound is linked. So a line that ends in pua, and the next line starts in pua aku. Okay. So this was recognized by ethnomusicologists and folks who were looking from the 1880s or so. So it's first mentioned, and then um, some of the really good work that's been done by formal ethnomusicologists. So it's called linked assonance, and that's its own skill. But once we started to look at poetry, and Larry Kimura is who brought me into this, because he was kind of stumbling around on, but wait a minute, because somebody without the language can see that. It ends in pua, it starts in pua. But what about one that ends in pua and starts with mohala? They don't match, but they, they'll mean or opua and opu. One means flower, one means bud. And so it, by related meaning, but they don't sound the same anymore. And then there's ones where the, the end of a line will end in vela, and the next line starts with anu. So it's in opposition. So there's, there's four or five different ways that you can do that same link. But Interesting. Not by now, is this an old form, or is this, af is this post-Western? It shows up in really old poetry. Oh, that's beautiful. So it's really, and some of it, I, I mean, we can see there are links. This is held together, but there's things that we still can't quite identify because we can't grasp all the meanings of that image. So I remember one of the oldest chants that we'd looked at that showed up in the newspapers, and it's talking about, it seems to be, the view of if you were on a canoe on the Lanai side of Maui, and all of the peaks looked like the fins of sharks moving through the water. Okay, this is a, an image that it's a little hard to distill today. So, because I'm not on a canoe somewhere out there. Um, so I know we still, we're fumbling through. I'm still a student, I'm still working on it. At this time in 2009, Puakan Nogelmeyer is busy teaching at the UH Manoa 
and he's busy generating abundance. To generate abundance is the English translation of Ho'olau Pa'i, the collaborative work in progress digitizing thousands of pages from old Hawaiian language newspapers rich in history and cultural knowledge. You can find it online at nupepa.org. I'd like to thank Dr. Puake Nogelmeyer and you for joining us on Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho kako. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. Who do you go to as kupuna? Okay. Now you could make me cry here because <laughs> it's really, really hard today to find people that I can ask the questions that come up for me. But I've had wonderful people in my life, so I'm happy for that. Um, actually, my playmate and my bud is uh, Lolena Nicholas, who was um, the first teacher on Oahu for the Puna Naleo. So she's been with that. She comes from Niihau. So when I do have questions, oftentimes I'll pose it to her. But she and I used to go to, like Kamuela Kumukahi um, was my foster father. And just, I mean, he just became this powerhouse in my life. And him, I could just call out of the blue and go, how come I'm okay? <laughs> you know, Is that what? Kuifo's father? Yes, yeah. And she had introduced me to him saying, talk to my father and Owen. And he had not spoken Hawaiian for 50 years. So I talked to him in Hawaiian and he answered back in English. He talked to him in Hawaiian and he answered, but he understood everything I was saying.